Hi, my name is Lindsay Hochul. This is day five of Rock the R. Um, Rock the R is an annual event that I am hosting right here on my Instagram account through Speechy Things just to get SLPs geared up for the year and ready to rock the R. Every night I've had a different guest speaker and tonight I have Dr. Farquharson from Class Lab FSU. I am so excited. Um, just something, a housekeeping item. If you have not already signed up for our freebie, I'm gonna be sending it out on Monday and you can go to my website. I'll be sure to have that link in my stories, but if you go to speechythings.com slash rock dash the dash r dash freebie, then you can find it. And I'm gonna see if I can send a request. Thank you guys for being here. Invite. It's been awesome so far and tonight's gonna be no exception, yay! Yay! Hey. Turn that around so you can see oh, me there. <laughs> I was like, it's stunning. What is it? <laughs> I know. I was like, how do we turn this around? <laughs> hey. Hi. Well, welcome to Rock the R, Dr. Farquhar. Hey. Oh, Lindsay, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I think I said on my uh, stories uh, this evening, I think I said I'm so excited like 10 times. I was like, Jesse Spano from Save by Dolls. I was like, I'm so excited. I just have been looking forward to this for so long. It is mutual, that is for sure. And I, I've already warned people selfishly. I'm like, ooh, I have so many things I wanna ask you. So we'll see if we're, try to be respectful of your time. I don't wanna keep you too long, but I don't know, I might. Well, have. and you know I can talk, so I, <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to get uh, off on a tangent too much, but. <laughs> don't even worry about it. So a quick intro. This is Dr. Kelly Farquharson from the Children's Literacy and Speech Sound Lab at Florida State University. She publishes awesome research. Just Google her name, a million things will pop up. It's very clinically applicable, and I've cited it many times in my presentations. Big fan. She also, along with Dr. Laurel Bruce, has the um, Embracing Expertise series available through SLP Tool Academy, Bright Ideas Media, which I've, I'm like halfway through. I, I know I have till the end of the month, but it's been so awesome. And they talk about the clinical relevance of phonetics. And you're about to come up with some Bjorn cards. Yes, I'm so excited. I can tell you a little bit about it now, or I can wait till we kind of get into it. But I, I'm just, it's been an amazing opportunity. Whatever you think is going to fit the best, I'm fine either way. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, so I'll start with the Embracing Expertise series really quick, just because that one is kind of time sensitive. Um, that is a four part series um, that's hosted by Bright Ideas Media, which is our lovely friends, Lisa and Sarah, SLP Toolkit. And um, so it was created by me and Dr. Laurel Bruce. And so it's four and a half hours of ASHA Continuing Ed, and it's all about phonetic science. And so we called it Embracing Expertise because we really, um, in preparing for it, we're really like, this is all stuff SLPs learn in their training, and it's really an opportunity to embrace that expertise. And even though we learn it, we sometimes don't really learn how to apply it, right? So we know that R is a liquid, but we don't often know like, what exactly does that mean? And so, and what does that mean clinically? So we'll talk a little bit about that today, but it's a really in-depth series. So if, if, if what I'm saying today is of interest to those of you who are here, thank you so much for um, being here. Um, check that out because it's really like in depth and it's $90 for all four um, sessions or you can kind of buy them piecemeal if you prefer for 20 or $30. And then the, um, the cards that I'm working on with your speech publications. So I'm working on two separate projects with them and one is an R facilitator deck. So I'm working with Dr. Carol Koch at Samford University, and um, Jenny Bjorn has just been so supportive of our idea. Um, we are creating this deck that is all different facilitative context for producing R. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that tonight, but it's... Um, it's all done. So we have all of the words selected. We have about 146 targets in this deck. Um, it will come with a screener. Uh, I do have permission. I got permission from Jenny to share all of this as kind of a preview. Um, it hasn't even been sent off for artwork yet. So it's like, you know, we're, we're done creating, but it's now has lots of stages of production to go. So it's probably going to be 20 to early 2023 before it's 
a tangible product, but oh my gosh, I just can't wait for it. Um, but it will come with a screener that allows you to figure out what the facilitative context is and then move into the deck and, and use the facilitative context that that is, that is good for that particular child. So I'm just, can I pre-order it now? I know. <laughs> I know it's really cool. And you know, we had talked about hoping that it would be ready for ASHA. Um, but the timeline of that, you know, Carol and I are both full-time professors at different universities and, you know, it just wasn't feasible to get that all done. We really kind of need the summer when we're quote unquote off to, to really get the heavy listing of the work done. So I wish it were going to be available sooner, but, um, when the pre-order is available, I promise to let you know. Please. I will be first in line. Awesome. Well then let's, I'm going to jump right into my first question. Okay. Yes. So, well, this is the selfish part of me, you guys. What I want to know from a phonetics professor, now that I have access to you. Yeah. So R in the middle of words, mm -hmm. I have heard it called so many different things in her vocal, mm -hmm. radio, initial post vocalic, medial pre vocalic. I would love to know like, how you conceptualize that. And yeah. Well, you know what? I'm just so glad you asked me this in advance because I think if you had asked me on the fly, I would probably just say, which is basically going to be my answer anyhow. I was like, it doesn't totally matter too much. I think what matters more is that you're aware of why you're using the terms you're using. So when I hear intervocalic, you know, anytime we kind of hear that, um, that segment or morpheme of the word vocalic, um, we know that it has to do with the vowel. So when we say something's pre-vocalic, we know that comes before the vowel. If it's post-vocalic, it comes after the vowel. And then, so then intervocalic is between vowels. Um, so I think that that is an appropriate term, but I think as you and I have this love for the R sound, we also know that, you know, most R is vocalic. You know, there's, you know, is there really a pre-vocalic R is, is a discussion you and I have you know, had through Instagram, like, is that really a thing, you know? Um, and so I think it's almost more important to be thinking about um, the vowel that it's with. Um, and so, and, and then also word position is important. So if you have that vocalic R, like the R sound as in arm, we would say that's, you know, initial position, but, but it's a vocalic R. Um, and then if you've got that in the middle of a word like farm, you've still got vocalic R in the medial position of the word would be appropriate to say. And then of course, if you have like car, you've got R in the final position of the word. So I think it's just really thinking about um, um, syllable structure can really play a part of that. So, you know, where a syllable begins and ends can play a part in whether or not you use the term medial versus intervocalic versus something else. Um, but I also really think it's more important to kind of just focus on the structure of that word, because as we've just talked about, I, I saw that there were a few comments saying they missed the um, announcement about cards. Um, I'm working on a um, card deck with Bjorn Speech Publications that is an R facilitator deck. And our whole mission is to capitalize on what we know about certain mouth positions that make R easier to say. And so when you're thinking about the vowels, um, if it's in the middle of the word or the beginning of the word or the end of the word, matters a little less and matters less really what you call that because it matters more that you're paying attention to what that vowel is. You know, if it's a back vowel, um, meaning that your tongue is in the back of your mouth, that could be a more facilitative context for the production of R because that's putting the tongue where it needs to be um, for most productions of R, right? So there's variability there too. Um, but then you also have the lip rounding. That's a natural feature of back vowels in English. So um, when I'm saying front versus back here, think about the vowel quadrilateral that you learned about in phonetics. And I know it's it may have been a painful time to learn phonetics. I always loved it, but I know that it's not everyone's favorite. Yeah, there she is, beautiful. Um, but that vowel quadrilateral is representing the mouth. So you've got the front of the mouth and the back of the mouth. So the back vowels, you know, are mostly produced with lip rounding. So yes, they get the tongue in the right position, but they naturally produce lip rounding. Um, front vowels in English are all unrounded. So you might not get the tongue in the right position, necessarily, um, you know, if you want a more posterior tongue position, but you avoid lip rounding. And for some kids, that's a nice place to start if you really want to try to avoid it at the beginning. Um, 
but you know, I also wanted to make sure I promoted your SLP summit session um, because you talk about this of like, yes, we want to avoid lip rounding sometimes for some kids, but the reality is a lot of the times when we're producing our, our lips are rounded, you know, um, that has to do entirely with the vowel though, you know, mm -hmm. Just recently, actually, I'm, I'm working with an older kid right now, and it's so interesting to work with a teenager because there's just this next level of awareness. And whenever this person was pointing out, they were really thinking about what they were feeling when they were producing one type of art that they said really well and another that was really difficult, they brought up the lip ground. They noticed they were not or the incorrect R. So I just. Interesting. You know, right? I know. I'm yeah. not a, a kid do that. But anyway, keep going. Sorry. Yeah. And it, and it is so fascinating to get their insight on it too. You know, and you probably work with those kids who, you know, you say the word, um, you know, say rock and they say walk and you say, no, say rock. And they're like, no, I am saying walk. Like they, they think they are saying it because that perception piece is important too. Um, and so that, you know, when they've got that real solid W, they've definitely got the lip rounding going on. And that, that can be, uh, you know, um, eventually you do want them to be able to produce R with rounded lips, right? Because words that have back vowels, like, like ooh and or, um, you know, for and food, like, um, sorry, those aren't, that's not an R word, uh, rude, you know, you've got the, the lip rounding for the ooh and rude. Um, you can't say that R sound without rounded lips. You have to have rounded lips for the production of that word, the, the R sound in that word. And that, that assimilation is a normal part of co-articulation. You know, it's just very normal to have a little bit of, um, features from sounds that are in the word show up in other sounds in the word. And that's basically what we're talking about when we talk about facilitative context is what is the context of this other sounds in the word? And can we use that to capitalize, to put the tongue, put the lips where we want them to be to target the sound that's really challenging to make. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, in the same way that like, if you're working on fronting or backing, you might avoid words that have K and T at the you know beginning and end like cute or cat. You want to avoid you know those words because you're trying to get the tongue in one position. So that would kind of be a anti facilitative context for that particular target. You know, so for R, the challenge is just how complex it is, you know, and how much variability there is. Yeah, absolutely. And y'all, I'll say it again: the embrace. The Embracing Expertise series, Dr. Far Carson goes more into this, and it will blow your mind. It's so helpful, and it's so clinically relevant. I really recommend it. Don't miss it. Right, guys. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to the next question, and then I'm going to make a note to myself if we have some time. I'm more. Yeah. Um, okay, so... I are written so many different ways, and I could possibly die from embarrassment. I'm pretty sure what you're about to explain is something I've been doing wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, you know, okay, go ahead. Oh, please let me know. Yeah. Oh, okay, um, so, right, so how to transcribe R, right? So, um, I've kind of been on this mission lately to um, enforce the upside down lowercase r in our field. And um, that is, it, you know, when you think about the International Phonetic Alphabet, um, which was created in the 1800s and was not created by speech pathologists or for speech pathologists. So that's another important thing is it was really created to help linguistic um, linguists understand different languages, right, and, and some of the overlap. But it's a really great tool. And so once our field adopted it, you know, we did a few things to make it easier to use. And over time, one of the things we did was take the um, the symbol for the English rhotic sound, R, er, um, which is an upside down lowercase r, and we flipped it right side up because it's just easier, right? Um, it's easier to just write the right side up lowercase r. And so you'll see that in textbooks, you'll see that in standardized assessments, You'll see that in a lot of materials that are still created. Um, is that wrong? Yes. 
Technically, yes, that is wrong. That's not the correct symbol in the International Phonetic Alphabet. So the little lowercase r um, is the trill, the one that you would hear, like a, like a rolled r that you might hear in Spanish or Portuguese or a lot of other languages. Um, so my um, goal with emphasizing the upside down lowercase r is that one, it is actually the correct symbol for the er sound, for the r at the beginning of run or rain. Um, that's the symbol. Um, when our field was relatively new, and we are still a pretty young field, um, when our field was relatively new, um, we didn't have a lot of diversity. We still really, really struggle with diversity as a field, um, but we weren't really thinking about cross linguistic influences in our in our therapy and our sessions and our assessments. And so now that we have much more diversity on our caseloads, so we still don't have a lot of diversity as far as clinicians, but we do have a lot of diversity as far as the kids we see on our caseloads. And so there are kids on our caseloads who speak Spanish or who speak a language and, and adults on our caseloads too, or who speak a language that uses the trill, uses the rolled R. And we need a way in order to be precise, in order to be good clinicians, in order to be practicing at the top of the license, right? We need a way to reflect that difference, right? And so if we're using the right side of R, we're basically saying, your language doesn't matter. I speak English only. We're just going to do this because it's easier for me instead of acknowledging. And, you know, once you get used to it, it's not really hard at all to write the R upside down, um, which, you know, once you get a little bit of practice, it's super easy. Um, and it is really a culturally appropriate way to represent that, that difference, you know? And so that's kind of where I've been focusing our our attention. Now, I've had a lot of people kind of push back and say, like, you know, the Goldman Frisco still has the R right side up. And my response is, if the Goldman Frisco jumped off a bridge, would you? Absolutely not. <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's okay that it's okay that it's not um, represented correctly in a standardized test that's published. That's okay. That is developed by humans who don't do things perfectly and correctly every single time. It wasn't created by some random machine, it was created by people. And so I'd like to think that over time, as these, um, as this is becoming more something that's more cultural responsive um, action, that more textbooks and more tests, more products will reflect that. And you can be guaranteed that our Bjorn speech publication, our facilitator deck will have the upside down R. Um, and then, you know, for the, the capital R, where there's there's capital up, right side up R and there's capital upside down R, and both are two different symbols. Neither represent sounds that are in the English language. One's a uvular trill and one's a uvular fricative, neither of which I can pronounce. They're very, I mean, they're uvular. In English, we don't use the uvula as a articulator. Um, so it's really hard, you know, it sounds kind of like a velar sound, but not quite as far back. And it's really, um, I, I, I won't do it justice because I'll sound mostly like I have COVID again or something. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a very, um, uh, it's a it's a uvular trill or fricative. So they're um, the right side of the person's upside down. Now, the you know it's not like a picky thing of having to use you know one symbol and only one symbol because you also want things to be able to be communicated across fields, right? And so our field is really specific on speech sound production, and we're the only field in in education that really knows the phonetic um, system. You know, IPA. Um, you want to be able to talk to parents and teachers. So it's perfectly fine to use a capital R, right side up R, when you're talking to parents and teachers and you're writing an IEP goal. Like that's, that's normal and you're going to have to kind of adjust within that, you know, system. Um, one way to kind of counteract it, though, is to, instead of using slashes around those symbols, to just use quotes. Um, because quotes kind of just says, like, it's, it's this sound, you know, and we're talking about English, so it's this sound. Slashes really say this is a phoneme. And so that's that's where it can get a little um, tricky just to make sure that the communication is clear. Because it's absolutely possible you could be writing an IEP goal for someone to work on the trilled R. Um, you know, that, that's a possibility, especially if you're a bilingual SLP. So you'd want to make sure that it's just clear which sound you mean. And just, I saw somebody ask what the trill R sounds like, and you're, that would be like the rolled R, right? Like mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 
we can do. Yes, yeah, so which as a monolingual English speaker is not going to sound as natural coming out of, you know, but like perro in the word, like that means dog for, you know, in Spanish. So like that trilled R in the middle there. Yeah. And that's also, you know, the, um, the alveolar tap. Um, do you remember learning about that? That like in the middle of the word water, like that T sound, if we, if we say it as water instead of water, right? Instead of aspirating the T and keeping it voiceless, when we say water, we kind of make that medial sound almost like voice. It almost sounds like D, but not quite. So the symbol for that looks like a little hooked R. It looks like a little cane. It doesn't have the stem, but it just has like the cane. And it looks like that because it's, it's a very rhotic kind of sound. Um, and so in some languages, it does sound like the trilled R. It sounds like the start of the trilled R. Um, so I have a lot of students who, in phonetics class, I teach the um, juniors here at Florida State, um, who get confused because it looks like an R, and it totally does. And that's because in some languages, it's actually used um, in the presence of, of some R sound. So it gets really messy really quick. So interesting. And I love the heart you put behind all of this, talking about, like, cultural sensitivity and you know I feel like you bring that into so much of what you do and I just really appreciate that. Thank okay. you. And Bruno's I see someone saying yeah. Yeah. I know these comments are cracking me up. I think I we're all ready to throw a little bit of bridge. I, and you know I, I would like to develop some like you know phonetics refresher courses and I do think within the embracing expertise series um, Laurel and I really worked to create something that in, there's a 90 minute session in the Embracing Expertise series, which is still available through August 31st. Um, the 90 minute one was the, was our live kickoff. And, you know, we don't go down into brass tacks basics of phonetics, but it's a really good place to start if you kind of do need a refresher. From there, we go into the weeds with it. So it's really like, you know, we, we really get, get down into it with theories and and different um thought processes but that first one the 90 minute one is is really a good place to start if you um if you're wanting kind of a refresher and it's so good y'all it's so interesting and i'll throw out here one more time that dr farquharson has created a just like one page little cheat sheet on the different symbols to use for our description of what they are in their history so you can just slide that in your desk feel like a genius knowing how to transcribe everything. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm curious, in your research, I know you're not, you don't only do research on the RSM, just what I'm <laughs> asking you about. She's broader than that. But is there anything that has surprised you? Yeah, so I do. So I, I run the Children's Literacy and Speech Sounder Class Lab um, here at Florida State. And so we do broadly study literacy um, with a focus, you know, our, our main population of, of interest is children who have speech sound disorders. Um, and I'm really interested in the kids who have single sound errors. Um, you know, we, we study a, a kind of across the spectrum of severity, um, but I really love those single sound error kids. And that's because what surprises me about working with them is, you know, they have a single sound and error. So we'll focus on R for the purpose of this. Um, there are always issues with spelling. And, you know, I have this other kind of line of work that has looked into um, really helping understand eligibility guidelines, particularly in the public schools. I was a school-based SLP before I got my PhD. And so I'm really passionate about making sure that school-based clinicians are not speech teachers, that they're practicing at the top of the license, that they're really doing the best for these kids. And um, one thing is, is really to... Um, be mindful of the educational impact of even a single sound error because we don't always see it show up with difficulty with reading but a lot of my research shows the connection with spelling okay. um so we just had this summer we ran a dyslexia diagnostic clinic and we had a few kids come in purely for dyslexia testing but a lot of them had single sound errors so these are third fourth fifth graders who um, should have had a diagnosis of a long time ago of dyslexia if they needed it. Most of them did. Um, and, you know, came to us to get this comprehensive, you know, six hour testing battery, which was just, our students were amazing. It was a lot. Um, I can talk about that another time, but um, the kids who had speech sound issues usually had one sound and error. Two of the kids, it was R. 
And in both cases, it showed up in the spelling assessments we gave. Um, they would spell R words, including a W instead of an R, or they would um, leave R out completely. Just drop it because that's what they do in their speech, right? They're sounding something out. It's not there when they're sounding it out. So they're trying to sound out like um, um, flavor, and they're saying flava. So they sound it out, and there's not an R at the end of that word for them. So they're, when they're sound, they are sounding it out. They're doing a great job of sounding it out the way that they say it. And so they would omit R. They would um, put a W instead of an R. Um, or they would have the R just kind of misplaced. Like they knew it was there, but they had such poor awareness, like phonological awareness of where it goes. And so I think that's the thing that surprises me the most and continues to show up in the work that we do is just that connection between speech and spelling. And um, I think we need so much more work there. And we see it show up in reading too. I mean, that's kind of what started me on my PhD journey was seeing it show up in reading for some of these kids when I was in the schools. Um, but now that I'm really into it and digging in, it shows up so much in spelling. Yeah. And what a powerful assessment tool that, I mean, wouldn't take that much time for us to add to our little, whatever we're yeah. doing, our formal assessment. And this relates back to what Becca, Adventures in Speech Pathology, and I were talking about the other day, that most of your students that you see with partners, they have some kind of phonology or the issue going on as well, not just articulation. Yeah. Most yeah. So right, and you know, it, can, it can be a single sound error and be phonological in nature. Um, and and that, that can be true regardless of their age. And the reality is you don't know unless you do some testing. You won't know just from listening to their speech. Um, even if you've been practicing for a really long time, I, you know, you can hear it right away. You know, the kids walk in the door and, you know, we had one kid come in for testing and I said, hey, how's it going? So nice to meet you. He says, this was a four hour drive. And so immediately I'm like, okay, we're doing the Goldman Fristo. I mean, you know, within seconds, right? What I don't know is what underpins that. And no one, there's no possible way that any SLP, no matter how good you are, how long you've been doing this, there's no way for you to know, is that a motor issue? Is that a phonological issue? Is it a little bit of both? Um, without doing in-depth testing, you can't know from a screener. You can't know from just listening to them talk, you know. Um, you really have to do some in-depth testing. Yeah, that's such a good point. Um, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, sure. So I'm kind of circling back a little bit more to the first question that I asked about our different positions of words. Yeah. I would love to know your thoughts on a medial prevocalic R versus a, a medial vocalic R. Because mm -hmm. for many students, I mean, we have the vowel moving into the R anyway. So I, I've i only had one kid. I it really mad the way I yeah. talk. We really have to work the way we conceptualize it because truly, they could only do a medial prevocalic R, but I'm just curious if you've come across that and what your thoughts are. Yeah. Oh, my dad's here. Hi, dad. Hi. That's so cute. Hi, dad. <laughs> um, give me some example. Like, which words do you mean when you say medial prevocalic versus medial vocalic? So, like a medial vocalic would be like farm, uh -huh. and then a medial prevocalic would be like oh. Maybe even it's so hard to separate it, right? I know that's the thing. That's the thing. <laughs> that's why I wanted to ask you about it because I've heard some people talk about this, and I've never really differentiated between the two. But I'm starting yeah. to question that in my own practice. Carrot. So it's really funny because a couple people just wrote in carrot, and I was thinking about that. But I'd say, and parrot, I'd say that's air. Like that's the vocalic air sound. Right? So you've got like R, air, ire, or, or, er, right? So you've got all these different, and there's so many different terms for that. Talk about terminology because you've got R colored vowels, you know, you've got uh, rhotic diphthongs, you've got, you know, vocalic R, and all of them are accurate, accurate to a certain, you know, extent. Um, yeah, I, so I don't know that it, it's really, hmm. 
pirate. Is yeah. it possible? Is it possible to have a medial prevocalic? Yeah. Well, and it's that, so complex. That was my thought too, because I had heard that said in a in a course that I took that they were really differentiating between the two, and I just had not come up. I, I hadn't come across a situation where I thought it even mattered, because either yeah. way, in terms of our motor plan, I mean, we're still moving through the vowel to the R. So I just I right. better. <laughs> here, here, yeah. yeah. Well, and and so uh, I just saw Laurel's here too, Laurel Bruce. Um, yeah. So she says place in the syllable may affect this, and I agree. I think it's um, the the syllable boundary is going to definitely you know carry some weight there. But you know that air sound like it's like airplane air in airplane is the same air as in carrot. That's a vocalic R, right? You know, um, I don't think it's separate as a. I don't think there's medial prevocalic. I think that actually be intervocalic, if anything, because you've got a vowel before it and a vowel after it. Right. Um, and so short, it's also medial prevocalic kind of because it's in the middle of the word and it's before another vowel. Right, but I I probably call it intervocalic, and then I, I think the reality is again like, can they say air, right? Can they say that vocalic r, or you know rhotic diphthong or whatever you want to call it? Um, can they say that sound? And then your job is to then vary the context for them, make it complex if they need more complexity, um, make it easier if they need a simpler linguistic context. You know what do they need in order to say that sound correctly, and then you're going to have to vary it, you know? So if they can't say it in the medial position of a word yet, um, you're, you know, give it some time. It could be that, that it's not a facilitative context. It could be that that particular vocalic R is just too challenging. And so I think that's another reason, like when we talk about single sound errors, I've also been kind of lobbying that R is not a single sound, you know, not in English, the tongue position. And that's the, you know, the Preston article that you talked about um, wanting to marry. Um, <laughs> That yeah. cracked me up. <laughs> I was like, oh, someday I hope someone wants to mar marry one of my research articles. But I'm with you there. That Preston 2020 article is a fabulous one. If anybody's watching and hasn't seen it. Oh, and then Megan Lease is here. Megan works in the Preston lab. Um, and, um, yeah, so Megan, you can weigh in, too. Um, the, the variability that we see in the correct tongue position for R varies so much, and it varies so much based on the vowel that surrounds it. You know, that's why it changes so much. And I think my favorite way to think about that for R is, you know, when I teach phonetics and we're very much going over place, voice, manner for the very first time, you know, our, our bilabials and our velars and then our voice versus voiceless and then our fricative stops, glide liquids, um, the, you know, R and L, are our liquids in English. And when you think about um, a liquid, you know, you're pouring something from, you know, this size, or this shape container into a small container, the liquid is gonna change based on the shape of what it's poured into, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so our liquids, our L and R, change. The, the, the mouth position changes based on what we, what word we're pouring them into, if you will, right? Is that like, if you're pouring it into a word that has high front vowels like E, you're gonna get that lip spreading, right? And if you're pouring it into a word that has high back vowels like ooh, you're gonna get that lip rounding, ooh, and high back vowel like in rude. Um, it's not possible to make that R sound. So you also talked a little bit in your SLP Summit presentation. So if anybody is um, just logging in, I think you have till April 15th to watch those, if that's right. And you have to watch Lindsay's session. It's so good. But you also talk about, you know, how unnatural it can be to tell to someone to smile. We do that a lot as our trick for, like, smile to say R, er. And that works for some context, but not all. It's not going to work to say rude, right? It's really hard to keep your lips in that position, and it's so unnatural. And that's why a lot of the kids we work with end up with unnatural speech around R, because we're not really being mindful of the context. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for letting me throw that curveball. <laughs> Anytime. Anytime. <laughs> um, are, is there anything else that you want to touch on before we move into the giveaway, which I'm so excited about? Um, well, I think there were a few people who came in after we talked about embracing expertise, and that's what we're going to raffle off. Um, the Embracing Expertise series is available through Bright Ideas Media. Um, it is created by uh, me and Dr. Laurel Bruce, who's here tonight, Speech.Geek. And um, it's 
four and a half hours of ASHA CEU approved content. And um, you can buy it in single sessions. So there's some $20 um, sessions, there's some $30 sessions and all together, if you buy all four and a half hours, it's $90. And tonight we're gonna give all $90, all four and a half hours away to one of your lucky people. And it's so good, y'all. It's so good. It's so I really, really encourage you to it. It's available through the end of the month. Um, okay, do you mind picking a number between one and 17? One and 17, um, 13. All right, Brit B 28. Brit B, you are our winner. Yay. Yay. And then you know what? Pick one more number. I'm gonna, okay. Look. So that one was so by Lisa and Sarah of Bright Idea yeah. Toolkit, so generous of them to offer free registration to this course. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna pay for one of you. So pick another number. Uh, so also between one and seventeen. So uh, do one in between one and six. Okay, four. It is communication craze. Yay! Go oh, around. Then I yeah because they're just so good and I just want I want at least two of you. To go watch it. <laughs> That's so nice of you. Thank you for doing that. Yes, of course, I'm just I've, I'm a big fan of it. I think it's wonderful information. And I just cannot get enough of the practicing at the top of the license mentality because I think yeah. it's easy for us as SLPs to feel overloaded, overworked. Yet that we're not workhorses, we are in our feet, and doesn't matter what setting you're in. We all have this incredible, yeah. training, incredible knowledge and passion. And I just love what you are doing. Well, right back at you. I've learned so much from your account and um, I loved your SLP summit session. And I've just, I'm so glad we connected. And I think you're one of those people that is a really good example for me of how positive and how wonderful social media can be as a place. I mean, I, you know, sometimes it's challenging to live here, but um, you know, connecting with you and everyone I've mentioned on tonight's um, live, I, those relationships wouldn't have happened if it weren't for social media. And so it's, it's really um, so grateful for being connected with you and, and for you inviting me. I've wouldn't, I've followed rock the R for a few years. So I'm just like, so jazzed to be a part of it. <laughs> well, I was nervous. I was like, should I ask her? I'm just going to do it and just say, yes. I was like, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm it, the feeling absolutely mutual. Thank you. Um, so I'll wrap it up and just let everybody know I'm going to post the replay video of this to my website along with links to everything that we have mentioned, including the presentations we've talked about, research articles, all the things that you could possibly want. And then please share with your colleagues. Make sure you are following class on Instagram for more information on science. And just thank you so much for being here and for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do. This has just been super fun. And I've been, I've loved watching everybody's this week. And thank you guys all for being here. And this is so great. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, have a good night. And y'all come back tomorrow night. I'm going to have Liliana with us from Bilingual Speech. We're going to be talking about treatment for Trill and Flap R. And oh, yeah. again, I'll post the link for the freebie on my website my stories because that's where you can get the cheat sheet that Dr. Far Carson did with the different phonetic symbols. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yay. Bye, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a dad theme happening. So fun. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.